Hello, everyone. Good evening, um, and welcome to Leap of Voices 6, the sixth installment, if you can believe it, celebrating two new books. My name is Rebecca Starr. I'm the Literature and Language Librarian at Portland Public Library, and I just want to thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We are going to begin tonight with a brief land acknowledgement. Many of us are gathered on land that is the occupied and unceded territory of the Wabanaki, the people of the place where the sun first looks our way, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations, and all the native communities who have lived in Chihuahuanqueag for over 3,000 generations in what is now called New England and the Canadian Maritimes. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth installment of Leaf of Voices. Linda Aldrich, Portland's Poet Laureate, organizes this series of poetry readings that feature a range of local voices through varying themes and collaborations of poets. Inspired by Walt Whitman's poem, Voices, this series is intended to highlight Greater Portland's active community of poetic voices and provoke thoughtful conversation around the art of poetry. Both of our readers tonight have new and forthcoming books of poetry. So should you wish to purchase them, I'm going to place links to print and bookstores links in the chat. It's my honor to introduce tonight's host, Betsy Scholl. Betsy's ninth collection of poetry is House of Sparrows, New and Selected Poems, winner of the Four Lakes Prize. Her eighth collection, Otherwise Unseeable, won the 2015 Maine Book Award for Poetry. Other awards include the Felix Pollock Prize and the AWP Prize for Poetry. She teaches in the MFA and writing program of Vermont College of Fine Arts and served as the Poet Laureate of Maine from 2006 to 2011. She was awarded the 2020 Distinguished Achievement Award from Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance. You could take it away, Betsy, thank you so much. Hi everybody, thank you for coming uh, to this grand occasion when we get to celebrate two poets and members, generous members of, of the poetry community. Gibson's first collection of poems, Death of a Ventriloquist, won the Vassar Miller Prize and was featured by poets and writers as one of a dozen debut collections to watch. His second book, Deep Dangle Dive, is forthcoming from Kevin Carey Press in May. Gibson's poems have appeared in many prestigious magazines. And what all this tells us is that he's a writer of serious and significant gifts. Gibson currently serves as executive director of Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance. And before that, he directed The Telling Room, a nonprofit writing center here in Portland. Gibson also served as poet laureate of Portland. And during his term, he began the deep water poetry column that uh, still goes on in the Sunday paper. It's a little miraculous for someone to have vision and the skill to realize that vision. And more than that, the generous willingness to do the work to realize that vision. And Gibson has all those gifts, which he generously gives to us. But tonight we're here to listen to him. And since I happen to know one blurb that will be on his new book, I'm going to read that blurb and then turn things over to him. I don't know what to praise more. The vivid bracing language of poems in Deep Dangle Dive or the sense of life that language delivers, a life fully lived and examined in all its rich complexity. Hockey is, as one poem says, a way of humbling yourself to the rules of the game. And that also goes for the making of art. And beyond that, the process Keats would call soul making, acknowledging the longing, love and grief that make us human. 
For Gibson, that involves exploring what it means to be a husband, a father, a son, and to confront the serious illness of his beloved brother. If the poet knows that form can never be close enough to the actual, still, when poems are as beautifully made, as emotionally compelling as these are, they seem to pulse with life and pass that life on to us through words that do indeed land in the gut and shiver the ribs. Gibson. Oh, thank you, Betsy. Uh, thank you so much. Um, those are, it's an honor to have those words on the back of this, this book. Um, and um, I'm excited to be here tonight. Um, thanks to Linda for, for organizing and Becca at the, at the Portland Public Library and everybody there and to print bookstore for selling our books. Um, and thanks to all of you for being out there in the ether. Um, it's great to see your, your Hollywood squares uh, with us tonight. And uh, I am going to read. I'm going to read poems from this new book that's coming out. There are, as Betsy mentioned, she kind of outlined, you know, the different strands. There's some hockey poems, poems about my brother, uh, and those two overlap. There's poems out of the domestic life, um, poems that 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 I think speak to the natural world and the human world. So you'll hear that. Um, and um, if we have time, I might read a, a new poem or or two. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to start with the first poem in the book. It's called Wing and a Prayer, and I don't think it needs any introduction. Hook me up to a current I felt once, birdsong so quiet it seemed an echo of birdsong, or a creek made of air the same temperature as a body, a silent humming I walked through. I'm supposed to let whatever happens be what I want, but I still want, I want, I want my brother's cells to stop their war on each other. I want a poet I missed too much when here. I want the body of a woman down the block to come back so she can see her kids grow up and they know they're seen. Deep in my shallow root system, all of this is so far beyond my small tangle of electric streets where one raindrop pushed to one side of one honey locust leaf can mean somewhere someone dies of thirst and somewhere else thunder becomes a god again. I always want rest. Oh, you godless godhead, positron, annihilation, ether or stream, bottomless, unnameable, but I will sit here as long as it takes and watch for any drip, flutter, or tick that could be your approving nod. So um, I've been working on this book for, for, for a bunch of years, and uh, I wrote a few of these, of these early hockey poems, which I'll, I'll read some of um, in a little bit. And then my brother got sick, um, and, uh, and, and those hockey poems became about that as well, because that was a game that we shared. And uh, it is strange. He, he died this summer, and um, so these, these poems were written many, in, many, in many cases before he died, but uh, you know, it feels like a good way to honor him too. And he did have a chance to read the book, which is a, is a tremendously meaningful thing. So this is... Uh, unwritten. In a poem I haven't written yet, my brother convinces me to put on hockey equipment, helmet to girdle to knee pads, and shoots and shoots and shoots in the driveway, the puck bouncing off of me. In the poem I haven't written for my brother but plan to, we throw haymakers on a hill he headlocks me on grass. I whip hard balls at his back. We scratch and gouge until a boy jabs his finger at me and my brother swings at teeth too big for that kid's mouth. In the poem, I won't let myself write. I say why I haven't written it, listing to my left with a tonnage in the bulkhead of bullshit that shifted before admitting that I did do will see him with a little brother's eye looking through Issen glass. In the poem that doesn't exist, I smile rather than ask why one summer he slogged at Gold Coast dogs and walked the beach alone. 
I number the cracked bricks in our apartments and admit all the nicknames he gave me, even G-string. I wish for red foothills, more hours we shared while our sons dueled with swords and wands and bikes and leapt from leaning forts. In the poem, I don't write, and the one I'm left with, while the shadows of grander ones gesture on walls, you're worried from sleep by phantom pain and real pain and scads of pills and insurance papers. And I get down on my knees and pray, Lee, to all I barely believe, because how else will there be decades ahead to be brothers? In this poem, I don't write, then don't write more. There's a little also a riff in this book, a strand of poems that, that riff on the idea of nothing. <laughs> you know, really it's an idea that, that comes from the famous Auden quote, for poems make nothing happen. <laughs> it's often quoted, that, that part of it is quoted. Um, and people say, poems make nothing happen. They don't often quote the rest of that though, which is, Poems make nothing happen, they survive. <laughs> so anyways, this is one of those poems and it, it, it sort of harkens back to um, me when I started writing poems in my early 20s. Making nothing, bright wings. At 21, there lived no evidence that I should write, no gift, no one asking me to give the dearest deep down things or myself permission to skip a lab and admit that medical school was someone else's dream I then now did not need to have, hold, keep. Except that I knew a girl, except that college let me escape a family in pieces like almost every plate, bowl, or dish I'd held. Except that I needed evidence that I felt things, that I had a life inside my life. And, and, dear misspent youth, dear unshotted days. I needed sound flicking in the tinder and springing forth from tips of grass and memories with teeth. And there was so much rain in Worcester that I was bare, muddy, bent double because I, I, from a long line of fakers, found a place I couldn't. I knew those terrible words would lead me on, on. This is a, a poem that I wrote for my two boys who I was saying before we started the event are um, both now I'm looking at eye to eye almost. <laughs> um, they're 12 and 15. Um, they were much younger when I wrote this poem. It's called Mock Heroic. I knew a girl who came from a tower of a home in Cartagena, trust fund, no one had laid a hand on her. All they did, all, each night at bed, was tell her to keep who she was locked inside her seas so no one would see it. Granite terror of that secret, wild horse eyes in the night. It's so easy to make broken people. I watch my boys mop all the syrup with syrup vehicles. How can I keep them from fearing? No one can make someone else know their own pale underparts, their own bladderless hearts. I'm gonna read a couple of, uh, a couple of hockey poems because I must, in honor of the, there, actually there might be a sound of, of a puck hitting the boards right while I'm reading, which would be pretty, pretty great. Um, <laughs> Cause that's what's happening outside the window over here even though the ice is, is not so good. All right, um, men's league, which I've retired from for the most part. <laughs> men's league. Last night's score sheet, snapped stick, missing helmet screw, a pinky I'll never straighten. On the bench this morning, I lectured two kids on the best way to get back at the boy who slashes and trips. Take the puck and score a goal, I said, like it's the easiest thing. Last night, I did the easiest thing, lowered my head 
and rammed ribs, shoulders, the pinky aches, a mark to remember how badly we want this game to last past the buzzer and final tally. And here's one more short hockey poem. This poem, as well as the title of the book, has this word deke in it, which if you have, haven't heard that word is, is just a word for a fake, a fake out, a decoy. Um, I'm gonna look like I'm going this way and I'm gonna go that way. And this poem is called How to Deke. The craftiest players know. Stutter step, sudden speed, the body plus boards, a false clue. Never have the same pattern, but stay steady enough inside the quick. Twitch, pivot, push, spring, to hear a scratch before a stick's poke check. Switch back, then swing between the legs of that colossus. Scissor, swizzle, and fire the puck so fast it rises to a mark. No one, not the goalie, not us, expects. And you will light, arms raised, our red, red light. I don't think this poem needs any introduction. The title is Going to Church. It's maybe a different kind of a church. Although, you know, I, I go to all kinds of church. This is one of them, <laughs> or this is a, a bunch of them. Going to church. Church of the smallest word, church of the eyeball and robin's tuning morning light, church of dog tongue, of sidewalk riven by daisies, of a high and tight fastball, of the shape and smell of my beloved's side of the bed, church of bricks that yesterday were building, of bread and butter and a bottle of beer, of creek stone and silver elm, of voices we hear asking in the still dark for a body to give them breath. Church of a quaver carried thousands of miles and given to the tiny bones inside an ear. Screenless, windowless church of a twisting northern wind. Of the night when a wall of trees too thick to see through called to my car. Of visions I shook from eyes and claimed I didn't see. I kneel here, I bring, a tin cup of water to my lips. So um, this is another poem about my brother and, and hockey. The last game. The night my brother's hockey career ended, he dangled to and dazzled across the ice, furious scripts the other team couldn't read. When someone's will, maybe a coach's, was done. A nod, two words, Number nine, this was 80s high school hockey. Better tape your fingers, hockey. Call the cops when the stands empty, hockey. So one kid knelt behind my brother and another cross-checked him over that knee. Whoever said the games we play don't have real stakes. Lee crumpled headfirst into the boards and lay there until a stretcher carried him. The doctor said a few millimeters in either direction would have snapped his neck. And now these doctors measure his game time, months, not years, not decades. My brother plays with cranial staples, infusions, endless forms, and learns the rules, penalties, and odds of loss. After that game, he left the team. I followed and stuck to empty Sundays, blasting Springsteen and slap shots on an unguarded net. This game we'd spent our childhoods on, lines and circles, was gone. Our mom and dad about to split, our rooms filled with blue lines we never crossed. And here is um, one, well, <laughs> Uh, one more, uh, another hockey poem. This one sort of from, from a parent's perspective, um, not sort of, it is Hockey Dad. Once you have ice blocks for feet, icicle fingers, and a lump in your throat to tremble your body with cold tomorrow, you doubt the sanity of waking at five, 
the eight-year-old on ice by six, blades carving shapes you can't name. And when your boy looks through his coach's face on the bench with red cheeks, a fire in each wooded eye, and complains about tripping, that number 16 with the black mask says, I'll chop him down next time. You doubt this game. At the hour you venture into the warm room to thaw out your spine and hear a father break down his son's backhand highlight spinner in a voice loud enough for all to hear. You know the annual backyard ice sheet was a bad idea. But also remember all those hours with your friends and your brother, legs pushed until muscles wailed, then sang, knocked down, scrambling up again, skating the last tenths off the clock, down, up, bearing each sore ounce, each breath and every sinew, humbling yourself to the rules of a game and the flawed eyes of a referee. And then ask, is this such bad training for what is to come? All right, I'm just gonna read a couple more poems. This is uh, actually the last poem in the book. It's called Dive. A new tumor on his heart doesn't sound like the ones on other organs on his heart. And now what treatment? Watch the clock, follow a salt road out as far as its end. Remember he's still here, send clips, a center's sick dangle showing what he makes disappear or a wing who blurs by blades and limbs then spins 360 degrees outside time, spinorama. Send a heart emoji. In hockey, a dive is when a player acts hurt and falls so that the ref calls a penalty. Here, it's something else. A brother dazzles, annoys, enrages, awes, leads his younger for 44 years, then the elder begins a fall. Or maybe this descent only acted like other motion all along. Maybe all our motion is down. Where's the ref? What happens next? In this moment, then another, a center my brother skates off to find. All right, I'm gonna just end with just one more poem. I'm just trying to decide which one. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna read one poem that's not in the book. All right, I'm gonna read this one poem because it has my brother's sense of humor in it, which was wicked, <laughs> right up until the end. This is called Weasel Mobile. When my brother lay in his last bed, endless hours of rack and wreck, my mom said, if only we could weasel our way out of this. And he chuckled. Regular boluses of morphine kept him mostly floating over crevices of pain. He said, we need to find a weasel mobile. Three days later, he was gone and she followed not two months later. And so I see them riding top down on an endless lakeshore drive, pure blue above and along the east horizon, 10 slender white striped weasels power the drive belt, making the car so fast it almost floats, and one pops out of what I thought was an air vent. His head swivels to take in sky, water, speed, my mother and brother, and whispers between his teeth, faster? All right, that's all I got. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Gibson. That was beautiful. That was so good. It make, you make me want to learn some kind of a sport to have that great language in it, you know, deep dive, dazzle, and all those fabulous words. Thank you. So now it's my privilege to introduce Linda Aldrich, who is our current Poet Laureate of Portland and has done much to bring other poets and voices 
into our community in conjunction with the library through this series we are part of right now, A Leaf of Voices. Among the other voices that she has brought to us are ones from indigenous writers and writers of color. And there was another reading that celebrated teachers who write. Linda also co-hosts with Marsha Brown, another series that the local buzz, um, which comes to us through Zoom and the Cape Elizabeth Library. Linda's background before these things includes being an actor in San Francisco and teaching English in several colleges in Colorado and Maine. Her two previous collections are of poetry are Foothold and March in Mad Women. But we're here tonight to celebrate the stunning new book, Ballast. I looked up the definition of ballast, and here's what it says. A heavy material such as gravel, sand, iron, or lead placed low in a vessel to improve its stability. And there is heavy material in these poems. They do not shy away from the darker histories of Puritan New England and the AIDS crisis of San Francisco, Vietnam, and the hard scrabble lives of some of her own quirky and endearing relatives. But it is a gift to be given these histories, to be deepened in our own self-understanding. And the gift is given in language that is sometimes luminous and sometimes deliciously sly and witty. And heavy or not, it's all for the sake of keeping the vessel afloat, which is both our individual and our collective lives in the world, where we desperately need truth and also the beauty that allows us to face it. And there is beauty here in abundance, in vivid language that moves in surprising ways across the page in forms that are sometimes wildly inventive. If these poems place us firmly in the tangles of history, they also move through those complexities to arrive at deeply moving clarities. And they are playful as well. There are seven sonnets each followed by its own erasure, as if this whole book is searching for what is essential for the heart of things, how heaviness keeps us afloat. Linda. Betsy, thank you so much. Really touched by that. And I feel really happy to, to be reading with Gibson and to be here with Betsy, two people I really admire and love as friends. And I'm really grateful to the Portland Public Library and to Rebecca for all of her help and for providing a home for the Poet Laureate Program of Portland. That, that's something that Gibson set up and I'm, I've been deeply grateful for that. So I have a new book finally, and it's a really beautiful book. Uh, through Deerbrook Editions. Jeffrey Haste makes beautiful books. And the cover is done by a new friend of mine who I believe is here somewhere. I, I can't see her right now. Lily Morris, who's an artist in Georgia. It's one of her paintings that she generously allowed me to use as my cover. So we'll start off with some heavy stuff. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to start off with a poem that's based on this uh, image, which I'm sure you're very, really familiar with. It's uh, a Hokusai print in the belly of the wave, the great wave. And I'm using it as a sort of a prologue poem. In the well of a wave off Kanagawa, Hokusai 1830. In the same boat with Hokusai, I watch other boats, slender arcs of yellow moon, struggle in the dark water, ride the back of a wet dragon 
that roils and rises mightily over them, all froth and disruption, a tower about to collapse. This is the day they will die. This the moment before it happens, before they jump through small windows of time. They are facing away, pulling hard on the oars, hoping to slide up one side down the other as though theirs is just any row of eyes going someplace. Their oblivious heads lined up, thinking of those they left on shore. But look, they're already dead and don't know it. Hokusai has filled their sockets with black ink, their mouths fall open. He looks past them to Mount Fuji and the mountain looks back at him, cloaked in white, impassive, unmoved, like a line of rope thrown to us. Our boat steadies, holds taut. If Hokusai decides to jump, I will take his hand. So I did organize my book around seven sonnets. I don't know what I was thinking in trying to write these seven sonnets. They were so darn hard to do, but uh, I do have them. And I hearkened back to a time in my life, 1985, when I lived in San Francisco during the AIDS epidemic, another epidemic. And I was also doing a lot of theater back then. And I think I wrote these sonnets in answer to the question that I've received about, you know, people will say to me, do you have any children or didn't you want to have any children? Why didn't you have kids? Which is not an easy question to answer under any circumstances. And these seven sonnets are just a very partial answer, but I will read them to you and they're linked. And so I'll read them, they're, they're spread throughout the book, but I'll read them one after the other. Uh, seven scenes from a single life, 1985. One, at the Berkeley Psychic Institute, seven students and one teacher watched the air around my head to see what might appear about past lives and contracts I had hidden from my consciousness regarding children. A boy and a girl, they finally said, will come to you according to a pledge you made one day before this incarnation. But if circumstances aren't right for them to come, they understand and let you go completely. They know San Francisco's not a Mecca for straight men. And then there's the matter of your acting career, how paying the rent is a daily fear. Two, yes, paying the rent was a daily fear, even in the Mission District. So I had three part-time jobs and one was giving out free cigarettes in Union Square and one nearly got me fired for stealing a stapler from the mailroom at Bechtel, an evil giant known for its corruption. So I felt defiant and judged myself the lesser transgressor. Desperate times required desperate measures and Jean Valjean stole bread to feed his sister's children, right? This pleased my mind a bit, but I knew better. Women compensate by stealing, they say, when perfect love doesn't come their way. Three, perfect love hasn't come my way. I told the Filipino Lola on the bus who was knitting tiny booties and asked if I had children. And then taking hold of my arm, squeezing very hard, she said, you must have a child. It can be with anybody. That cab driver can do it. Somebody you see in Safeway, just go to bed before too late. You must. God tells me this. She shook me up so much I missed my stop and walking back past Joe's ice cream shop, I hoped to find a man who felt adrift for living in a city childless and alone, but lost my nerve and walked 10 blocks home. Four, 
Once I lost my nerve and walked home from the Golden Gate Bridge. I stopped halfway across to let a bottle drop into the water with a note to whomever it concerned, the universe perhaps, that things were tough and I was lonely. Please send a special soul to find me, not another actor or tipsy stand up. But holding the bottle over the edge, I realized it would smash to pieces, sending glass into birds and fishes, an environmental sacrilege. So I took my bottle home as fog rolled in. The misted breeze felt soft on my skin. Five. The misted breeze would soften my skin, moisturize me back to age 23, I hoped, adding years of fertility, keeping me fresh in my prime for him whenever he showed up. Or there were sperm banks where my gay friend Michael went each month to make some extra cash and reached the point of bringing his own magazine to firm the fella up which made me cringe for thinking how incidental was the impetus to create new life and how anonymous the father. And perhaps I was falling prey to some cultural idea of mother when Michael said it's okay to be another. Six, but did that mean I'd be just another single woman living in the city, pretending not to notice pitying glances when the irritated waiter put me at the tiny table by the kitchen, thinking how small a tip he'd make and how overly long I'd probably take with the book I brought as my companion? And did the diners imagine me at home waiting for my life to start while watching movie after movie and French buffing my nails? Perhaps sitting by the phone? They weren't far off, it was sad to admit. In the world as it was, I was a misfit. Seven, the world as it was put misfits on stage. So I dressed in a skirt and went to audition for a role in Our Town with my rendition of Lady Macbeth, who'd screw courage to the sticking place so as not to fail, and was cast as a woman who spoke from the grave about how bad the townsfolk were, except for weddings which never failed to make her cry. And for my actor brothers dying of AIDS, I helped pat on extra makeup to cover lesions before the curtain went up and the show went on. Nothing could cover this backdrop of death, but at eight every night, I took my place in our town and it felt right. So I lived in San Francisco for 10 years and then I moved to Colorado and I lived in Colorado for 20 years. And then David and I moved to Vermont for three years and we've been here for 10 years. So I'm dating, you can figure out, I'm getting pretty old. But when I moved here, um, I knew that my father's mother had grown up in Maine in Owl's Head, but she died when I was four. I didn't really know her and no one really talked about her, but I did some research. I looked up, Googled her name and uh, she came up in a, a website for descendants of Mary Dyer. And I thought, well, who the heck is Mary Dyer? Well, it turns out that Mary Dyer is my 12th great grandmother and she was hanged in Boston Square for being a heretic because the Puritans believed Quakers were heretics and um, they hanged her in 1660 but she had been kicked out of Massachusetts Bay Colony years before that. And she went to Rhode Island where she really explored her Quaker nests. And then she would go back to Massachusetts Bay Colony because there were friends of hers in jail and she would visit them and she would visit them and they kicked her out three times, I think twice. They banished her first and then they kicked her out twice. And then when she came back the third time, they decided that was it. So they hanged her. But back when they had banished her from the um, 
from Massachusetts Bay Colony, they needed evidence to prove that she was indeed a heretic. And so I'll just read this poem. I have a series of them, Buried Deep. Six months before her banishment, Mary Dyer gave birth to a stillborn. Unearthed by Puritan magistrates, the baby was used as proof of heresy, 1637. And some of the language in here comes from the actual report that was written. <clears throat> they say the baby had not legs or arms, but a horned face because no round head and sharp talons for toes. Indeed, all ugliness and for the sins of her mother was born dead and buried with haste in a blanket, the lanterns circle the only mark and that the midwife Mary's one friend whispered a small prayer into what was not an ear. The elder admonished silence, lest all women be encouraged in their lust, lest evil hear its name and grow among them. She named the baby Anne after the one who whispered and later showed her where the baby lay and sprinkled there some seeds of feather few. In the child's monstrosity she never believed or in any kind of sin brought manifest to children. Of her loss she could not speak and found herself put straight to work as remedy. But how she cried to gather eggs from under the hen's warm breast, reaching into that soft dawn as though to find a tiny hand and draw it close again. So it was just an odd feeling to recognize this woman as my, one of my great grandmothers and something inside of me just sort of went kerplunk like I recognized her inside myself and I can't even describe how that felt, but I thought I'd try and explore it in the poem. Perhaps there was a lot of shame, you know, in the family, no one ever, I mean, the story never came down, so I don't know what happened, but this is called Helix. On learning Mary Dyer was my 12th great grandmother. Hidden staircase, twisted ribbons suspended in the secret dark of marrow, random bones thrown down, replicating myself, self. I am Escher nightmare of not belonging, endless curl of stairs going up and down. Motherless daughters are not motherless, but lost, mother lost. Forged one night, joyous or forgettable, I was determined. Hazel eyes, widow's peak, tipped pelvis. The sin of standing out, gifts wrapped tight to my chest, breasts not growing, bound as blight my sexual self, my art a sign of strange turnings. A spine turning on itself, auger of double bind, alleles of shame carried. Behind locked doors we cried, not letting ourselves have too much, never a full sob. Women who wintered with dying geraniums, generations taking whatever was handed us, ingratiated with words that flew to the next burst, next bush, fell like frozen birds caught in the snare. Rabbit girls. We drew tight hives of circles around our witch, spun her until she buzzed and spit her dizzying power, our terrified game of tiptoe and chase. May I, may I. But now we cannot play, left limp, delimbed in the woods. Muted mitochondrial, mouths taped shut, noose, notice, ne not garot slip not hangman's halter at the end of 13 coils you dropped 13 generations came breakneck speed of snapping your breath on my back bone of my bone i meet you cut the rope not for naught okay <clears throat> now for something a little lighter 
um, I'm thinking about all the kids who are not in school. And I really feel for them because for school, for me as a child, it was really a lifesaver. And I had one teacher I particularly loved in the third grade. So this is about her. It's called Properties of Fracture. To break off edges of ice with my foot hastened spring. The more cracked loose from the continent of hard, the better I felt. The quicker my release from rubber boots and leggings where my white asparagus body lay inside a starched dress and prickly petticoat, stuffed into snow pants, jacket, scarf, a thick zipped package making its way to third grade for the love of Miss Carson and her many colorful shoes, for the perfection of her cursive S's cresting on the idea of beach, but mostly for her rocks and minerals. On the long table covered with butcher paper, village of density and striation, igneous and metamorphic, petrified wood, slippery soapstone, garnets tumbled from sediment, and in a cup, obsidian tears shot from fire. When spring came, I dug up drab stones like dirty potatoes from under the swings, smashed them to brightness with my father's hammer and put them on her desk before the bell. After the Pledge of Allegiance, after she took attendance, finally, finally, who brought me this lovely quartz? And mica, class, did you know people used to make windows from mica? Are these from you? She said, smiling her wide way into me. And she would never know how my dense universe fractured into whirls of light, pumices of moon. Geodes I would come to know later, how summer's embers bed down inside us. I wonder if she's still alive, Miss Carson. She got married, I don't know what her name was. Became. I think I will read this. The final appeal. This is when I've been teaching my own class at Southern Maine Community College when I was last teaching. I'm not teaching now. And I was trying to teach the argument essay, which is no uh, delight to try and teach. And I was teaching um, the appeals of argument, Aristotle's appeals of argument. This is called the final appeal. Argument comes from Latin, arguere, to make clear, to shed light on something, I say. And just then the sun comes out and fills our cold classroom. And out the window, the ocean that was so dark is now diamonds on the water, says my student whose father is a fisherman. And I think of him on a day like this of his chapped hands and the shapes that loom beneath him, whales, dolphins, giant squid. Last week, I tell them, curled octopus were found dying on a beach in Wales, and the townspeople gathered the soft sacks of their bodies and dropped them back into the sea, which gives those people a lot of credit in my mind, I say, lends them ethos. And then I tell them Aristotle would send his students out to the beach to count up the number and kinds of mollusks for logos, the evidence from which to draw reasonable conclusions. And my student, the comedian, wonders why you would care how many mollusks there were unless you owned an oyster bar. And much to his pleasure, we laugh at that one. But my student from Somalia says we should care because so many animals are going extinct and wouldn't it be sad to have an earth without animals? And if we really want to know something, the ocean is full of drowned people. No one is counting them. No one is picking them up. His words closing in around us like sea smoke. 
This is probably the newest poem in my book. And uh, I have two sisters, one of whom I'm very estranged from. We haven't spoken for over 30 years and I don't think there's any hope of that changing. But I decided to finally talk about it by writing a poem. This poem has some lyrics from Watch Closely Now, Chris Christofferson in A Star Is Born 1976, and also My Coloring Book, the second Barbara Streisand album, 1963. To my rumored other sister, whispered sister, I count back the years to your red braids where it ended. Watch closely now. A sister lost is a swallowed self. Are you watching me now? I'm a sad and guarded sister. Master magician, the more I crawled along my olive branch, the more angry you were. Oldest of the three, who's setting you free? Was I not your lauded sister, undaunted sister, flying us from the foaming river, from the lies you've been told? The unhinged house when they're breaking your back? A loved sister, bring your last straw to me, sister. I packed my bags and sent you foreign postcards, straw to gold, left you to handle it alone. Gonna need you later, don't look down. You won't forgive my not around. Haunted sister, color it lonely. Home early from school, I stood rooted, heard you secret sing, become Barbara Streisand in the basement. The room I sleep in, walk in, weep in, hide in that nobody sees, Oh, you were so crazy captured, sister. But truth be told, the most gifted song lifted. I have two more, but I think I'll just read one more actually, as we're coming to the end of our time. You've been a lovely audience and I thank you all so much for coming, some from Somebody's here from Ireland, if you don't know. It's really late for her, Beanie O'Dell there. And uh, I didn't see all my, I think my Aunt Phyllis is here somewhere. Did anybody see Phyllis, Aunt Phyllis anywhere? She might be here. I have two aunts left and uh, so many other friends. And I really, um, it's lovely. It's just lovely to be with you. I think the, um, artist is here, Lily Morris, who did the cover. This is entitled End of Summer. It's the last poem in my book. I was at Hune Oaks, which I know some of you know about, and I was awarded a week's residency to do some writing. And I got there and I just kept organizing myself to write, organizing myself to write, and organizing again. It was like the third day and nothing was happening. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna waste a whole week being here. This is gonna be just great. But then I finally um, wrote this poem. It's called End of Summer. The spider outside my cabin window stares at me. I think that's an eye. I can't tell which way is up. Another day at the arts retreat and I have nothing to show. But my spider is deep into her work. A complex net woven when my back was turned, the sun lighting filaments three feet across, a delicate sail of threads catching the breeze, filigree of gold where she hangs in the middle like a proud bobbin. Yesterday, I visited the studio of a woman who uses white extension cords to make intricate patterns. The plug ends bunched tightly together as though looking into the center of a peony bloom or a clutch of baby robins, beaks open, beckoning. The long cords wound round and through a hoop 
in a pattern of nest building or the matrix of longing surrounding a heart. I watch my vigilant spider inspect her web, make repairs, shore it up. She assumes fragility in a world where threads loosen, ties break. The woman who creates art out of things taken for granted walks across the wide lawn to her studio with a basket on her arm. It's the last month of summer. The late afternoon sun glows like a winter lantern. Thank you. Linda and uh, Gibson, I hope you can see all the fluttering hands going around. <laughs> We have a little bit of time for some conversation. And I've been trying to think about um, some questions to ask you and maybe Becca can keep an eye on the chat too to see if anybody puts questions in there. You both have written some poems about grief. And so I thought I'm, one way to start a conversation might be, for me to throw out a couple of statements and uh, see if you want to respond to them. So one statement is from W.H. Auden, who says, poetry is how we break bread with the dead. And another one comes, I know Gibson knows this one, from Ro Robert Haas's Meditation at Lagunitis. Uh, the word is elegy to what it signifies. And a third version of, of this whole idea of, of grief and elegy is something I think Rumi said, all poetry is about the loss of the beloved and it's a capital B beloved. So it might be, it might not be the individual, it might be a bigger thing. And I just wondered if any of those statements trigger any thoughts from you two. Yeah, those are great thoughts, Betsy. Yes, all of those things are true, I would say. Uh, yes, check. Uh, um, I mean, for me, it's tremendously helpful to me to write a, about my brother. It was it's helpful while he was sick. It was helpful after he died. You know, it's, I mean, for me, so much of poetry is about paying attention. It forces us, forces me to pay attention, you know? So no matter what happens with a poem, if it goes out into the world and, you know, gets published somewhere or not, it, it, it teaches me things along the way um, and helps me pay attention to what, what's happening inside me, around me, et cetera. So, um, and, and I think, yeah, it is a way to, to feel like you can visit with these people who are gone, I think, mm -hmm. um, for sure. Is, um, I, I think you that, can, you, that you yeah. can't not write about someone you love who has passed, who has died. I mm -hmm. think that um, I remember hearing one poet being criticized for having written about his wife who had passed away, for having written a whole book about his wife who had passed away. And uh, people were critical as though he was using her death to get material to write. And it's really the opposite of that, isn't it? It's really it's really the way that you break bread with your grief. It, you, um, you, have to, you have to write about this person. And, um, and that idea of um, all poetry is about the loss of the beloved, I suppose goes back to that, that sense of, we must have been whole once, you know, the world must have been golden once. <laughs> and where did it go, you know? Um, which may be a complete delusion, but but we tend to feel that that loss of some other that would complete us. Yeah. You know, you both play around with form a lot. Um, you, you know, traditional forms and forms around the page. Um, Linda did not read any of her erasures, but um, they're very interesting in the way they change the, the whole of the poem that they erased. And for instance, one erasure goes like this, back to thinking how incidental, how anonymous I was. That's from Sonnet 5. So, I mean, you both play with forms a lot and different ways. And I'm wondering whether 
you know, you you discover this al along the way, or you know, how how you arrive at the shapes that you make. I think for the sonnets, I gave myself that challenge. I think that forms are almost like puzzles that you work with. You're, there are certain parameters, certain rules mm. of, that need to be followed for it to be a certain form. And um, that's helpful sometimes to know that you can repeat a line or that you have to rhyme a certain way or it has to be a certain length or it has to repeat certain things. Mm. And I have found it freeing sometimes to be within a form and have found myself exploring things I might not explore. And I, I, uh, I was challenged to do the seven sonnets because I heard Maxine Kuhlman at Vermont College. She came to read a long time ago when I was in residency there. And she said, oh, I'm gonna start off with a new set of sonnets. It's a crown of sonnets. And I sat there and my mouth dropped open and I thought, Oh, that's like climbing a mountain. I don't know how people can do that. So I started to write these and it took me forever and I, I don't recommend it. <laughs> it was like climbing a mountain, but I, I kept going with it. Well, you look the other way too. I mean, you, you have poems that are spread all across the page and, and, and you do different things with form as well. You know, I, every, every poem's in form, right? right? You know, I mean, there's some, there's some container to fit everything, every, you know, we, and, you know, so we set, like, sometimes the forms are more organic, right? You just sort of make it as you're going, right? You figure out, oh, it's going to be this shape, and let me see if I can get it to be more like that shape now. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing I love about challenging myself with a traditional form and I, when I do that, a lot of times I like to try to break the, figure out a way to break the rules <laughs> um, or stretch the rules or, or whatever. Um, but also what's helpful for me is focusing on the, the particulars of the form and, and trying to make it work and be, the, be a good poem um, sometimes frees up my unconscious mind in a way. You know, I'm not so worried about whether it's a good poem. I'm just trying to fill some space. And as Linda was saying, you know, you get to a new, a new territory or a new mm -hmm. cliff that you never knew was there before. And it's like, it, there's discovery in that, which is, which is really, um, that's fun. That's neat. Wow. Well, let me ask you this. Um, how, how do you hear your poems? I mean, you both have um, a, a lot of, you, know, you both have good ears and there's a lot of sound in your poem and I'm curious about you know how much you actually wor work by ear and think about those things and how much it's all more unconscious so much of it is for by ear for me and and often it's um often the way poems begin for me is with the literal whether it stays or not but often it does there's a first line that just I hear it and and it's like that that one line has the whole poem you know contained in it not that I can see that whole poem you know mm -hmm. but but I definitely like the sound of the way that poem is going to 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 speak you know it just it sort of happens I was thinking of that first poem that I read tonight I'm pretty sure I know I got that it starts hook me up to a current I felt once you uh, know that's yeah. just a line that I you know, I, I don't know how it happened, but it happened. And then I was like, okay, I'm, I know I'm, so, I'm I know I'm going somewhere. <laughs> um, you and there's a, the there's current. A... <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I think that I, um, I, I, I'm sure a lot of you who write poetry do this, but I read, as soon as I, I even have a first line, I, I read it out loud to myself. I'm always reading everything out loud to myself constantly. So I think probably it, 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 I refine my rhythm, whatever the poem's rhythm is by hearing it aloud to myself. It will sound right or it won't sound right. Mm. And, and it has to be done out loud. I don't see it on the page mm. as easily. So, 
Um, I, I seem to do it that way. And then sometimes maybe I'll, I go back through, I repeat a lot of words sometimes unconsciously, even in the same poem, you know, and uh, I need to go back and change those words. And then I'll, then I'll look more at what's around the word that I'm changing and what will it sound like if I change it to this word? And then again, I'm saying it out loud again and again and again until it feels like it's a good fit. You know, that reminds me of Richard Hugo in The Triggering Town says um, that there are certain words that belong to a poet, you know, and, th and those words are her or his words to, to, to work with. And, you know, sometimes they can get overdone, I guess, like stone dark in, in the eighties were like <laughs> everybody's words they owned. But, but it's interesting to think that, that we have a, voca a vo vocabulary in a way, uh, or, you know, um, an accent of, from where we came, you know, um, mm -hmm. that, that's part of the sound of our poems that makes them ours. So I don't know, these might be boring questions for, for some folks. So let me ask you a bigger question. What do you want, your poems or any poem, when you read a poem, what do you want it to do? Mm. <laughs> or a corollary of that is, you know, what's a poem for? I mean, I just, I want to be moved and I want to be surprised. You know, I'm okay with a poem not you know, poems don't have to, they can, it's okay if some poems hold their cards close to the vest or some lay the cards out on the table. And, but I want to feel like something is really at stake for in the poem, that something matters that's happening there for the speaker, whoever that speaker is, whether it's the poet or some other person, that's sort of the heart of it for me. I back to the, what you were saying, Betsy, about the words that are yours or the music that's yours, you know, it makes me, I have thought as I get older, I, you know, you sort of realize things about yourself and I've realized that, you know, I, I'm attracted to a certain kind of a, like rough, a rough, a, I would describe it as like a rough music. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that maybe is, comes from just growing up in the middle of a city and being around sort of a, a lot of like, slightly chaotic <laughs> rough things at times you know if that makes sense sure so. sure that's great that's great i i too want my poems to move to to move they need to move me in a certain way and surprise me also in in what comes first and um I want them, I feel that, I remember Mark Doty talked about in a workshop once about, you know, you enter, you enter a poem, it's like you're in a room, you know, so you get into this room and then a lot of, lots of times you might get very so excited about that room that you just talk about what's in that room and then you come up with an ending and you're done with it. And I think that really, I, he said, don't do that. Look around in the room and open up the doors and see where else you can go. And if you can go deeper. And I think it, for me, that takes a certain kind of um, fearlessness or to open some of those doors. But I think also that if I can go there, if I can go to those places that hurt or are uh, shame bound perhaps or mm -hmm. awkward or things I don't talk about. If I can finally talk about them, I think that the poem will have more power. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not the other person's experience, I'm also aware that my poems are not just for me. They're for, you know, once I, they go out, you know, and they can be to other people what they need to be. And I want them, I think that if I can get to a truth inside myself that feels feels truthful or authentic or accurate mm. that it will communicate to somebody else and it will be meaningful to them and that's why I wrote write poetry that's why I read poetry mm -hmm. I want to know what everyone is feeling and what they're thinking and 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 what they're what they're bringing to their lives through language. 
I, I want them to share that with me. So I want to do that too. That. You know, what, what you just said it reminded me of something that um, Elizabeth Bishop said, and I don't know where I read this, but she said, a poetry is a combination of passion and form. You know, and passion without form, you know, can be your, your bipolar cousin on the phone at 3 a.m., you know, <laughs> or Aunt Gertrude, who um, has to tell the same story again, again, and again, and again. And form without passion, you know, is, is like the worst school teacher we ever had, right? <laughs> so the combination of passion and form, uh, passion given a shape. And I guess that's what all art does. So, so poems just do it in, in the way poems work. I, I think we're always hoping to tap into that um, vein. <laughs> I go back to what you said about the beloved. I think you're talking about, you're talking about the beloved, you know, the, the vein of love that humankind is capable of. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we come across it a lot when someone is dying. We, we come to the essential, the essential thing about what it is to be human with another human being. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that that's passionate, mm -hmm. you know, and the forms and poetry's hard, right? I think we all, we all who write poems, we, we work hard at those little things. You know? <laughs> We're, we're trying so hard to um, get them just right to, and to hit something maybe that we haven't hit before or in a, in a way differently, perhaps. Somebody said we just keep telling the same stories over and over again, but as we get older, the stories, the way we, we tell those stories has to be different. I think I just... Everything froze for me for a second, so I didn't hear the last part you said. I hope. Oh, I just, I, I just dropped off there. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a good ending. <laughs> I'll ask you what, one more question. Uh, you know, you each have, um, you each have a range of subjects. You know, besides hockey, Gibson, you, you has that sequence of poems on making nothing, which actually in each poem you are making something that's pretty hot shit, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> but, but you have subjects and Linda, you do too. You know, some, some of your subjects have been the exploration of history. And um, if, if you can talk about that in a way, what's it like to be, working with a subject or a theme or, or um, an experience that becomes bigger than itself, becomes a metaphor for something bigger. I, I would say, I just, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm interested, you know, a lot of my poems that feel like they have a subject actually come out of some interest in some bit of language, you know, and, and often I'm actually doing some research I'm going to see like oh how how is that how how did that word first you know where did it come from mm -hmm. but also and how did its use change and who used it and you know what what was that about and it's not real it's only sort of minorly in the book but um when I was working on some of those hockey poems I did a pretty deep dive on yeah, where did where did that game come from, and and why? What's the deal with these hooked sticks? What what is that about? You know, and um, who put it on ice? And you know, I, you know, and and is this a, a game that's tied to violence between men? I, I'm always interested in like following the path of ideas and and research, and then and I like to do it, and then one has to write a poem too. <laughs> so sometimes I think you have to just like you know, let go of a lot of that stuff, or there might be one, a couple little things from a lot of research that, that actually work their way into a poem, mm -hmm. but that's often enough, you know, that's mm -hmm. just some, some little, you know, bit of the past that, that can be brought in there and um, you can build a poem. Yeah. I think that um, maybe it's my theater background. 
uh, that I do like, I do write a number of persona poems sometimes, or maybe they're not strict personas, they're in the third person, but they are still from the point of view of that person. Mm -hmm. And um, I just have always liked exploring other characters and trying to get into their heads. Does that come from your theater background, do you That's think? I think, I, I can't, I don't know what else it could be, but I have done quite a lot of that and I've enjoyed that a lot. And um, I, I think the Mary Dyer poems for me are sort of like persona poems in a way, although I don't use the first person. Mm -hmm. But also they allowed me when I discovered her story to talk about things that I felt like I couldn't really access, like mm -hmm. violence against women, about the intolerance of groups of people toward other groups of people. You know, I, I, I could, you know, I could own those parts in my own history somehow and go into them a little bit more. That, that's a great point. The, the, I mean, how do we write about things in the world except by finding a focus, you know, you know a smaller frame that we can explore? Um, there, is, there are two questions in the chat and we may only have time for one, but uh, Bruce Spang says, both of you write about place. What does place do to generate a poem? And how did those places shape the poem? Yeah, I love the, the names of things. Um, so if it's whether it's the natural world or the different kinds of shots one can make in a hockey game, or you know, I just I like to get the 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 the, the, the stuff of whatever it is that I'm that's around me that's that I'm trying to write about. Absolutely, that to me that is a lot of what place is 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 noticing things around you and and naming things around you and and then you know putting that into the poem so neat i, I think that in poetry place is not um uh such a focal point as it is in fiction mm -hmm. or other forms of writing so i think i think all poems exist in a place but we may not it may not be spoken about as much in the poem itself, but I think we who write the poems, you know, if you if you go back and you look at the poems you've written, you know, and you sit with them, they are in a place. Mm. You know, I guess prime the primary place is that they came out of us <laughs> and we're in a place. But I like it when there is a place that you can actually draw language from mm. yeah. and images from. Imagery exists in place. Right. And you've done, you did a seminar on place where you began with the local and spread it out more and more and more increasing. Yeah, in someone asked me to do a workshop on place and I thought, oh, okay. And yeah, and I, I tried to start with the human body as our place. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, our own stories, our own lineage, our own uh, experiences all become part of these um, multiple concentric rings. I guess that's the way I kind of drew this medieval map. Yes. Of us walking around fat with these rings, you know, <laughs> but that we could draw from. Right. You know? We can just, we can just, there are, there, this is our, these are our lives. We've been in these places. There are so many places we probably haven't even touched yet. It's just, you know, where we could just pull, pull one, you know, just touch one thing there and we're in a whole, maybe we're in a whole new book, who knows? Like Narnia, you go to the lamppost and, and you're in yeah, right. <laughs> maybe we can find a lamppost. I would like to. I'm a little well, bit dull right now on inspiration. Well, that happens when you've just had a book come out. You have to let the the, the tide flow back in again, talking about place and <laughs> yeah. the tide goes out, the tide comes in. Well, it's 830. I, Becca, I don't know if you have anything else to say, but um, this was a beautiful reading and thank you for sharing thoughts. And um, Linda's book is for sale right now. What did I just do with it? It's for sale right now. And Gibson's book, 
put it in your ca ca calendar for May. I think you can right. buy it though now, right? You can early order. Gifts. Okay, okay, early order right. at uh, the yeah. at Kevin Carey, right? There well, print. print, yeah. Print. Print. Print the All right. Yeah. All right. Well, you oh, guys have been yeah. great, and thank you so much. And there were many poets in the audience, and thank you for being yeah. here, um, supporting. Yeah, thanks, everybody. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, Betsy, so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Gibson. Yeah, thanks, Betsy. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yeah,